that, that's a big issue. We have uh, this problem of, in, of international problems, and at the same time, people demanding more local decision making. So, the breakup of Yugoslavia into constituent states, the possible breakup of the UK with Scotland, we're in Catalonia wanting possibly to secede from Spain. There's a demand in this huge world in which you know everything seems to be coming in from goods from China and workers from other nations for more local decision making, and yet we have that demand from the public at the same time as we have the need for international decision making to solve our global problem. Pascal, how do we reconcile those two things? Uh, I, I, will, I will not answer this question today <laughs> in the way I would have 10 years ago. Uh, notably because uh, of the time I spent in Brussels and then the time I spent outside Brussels looking from the outside at how Brussels was working. Uh, and if the EU has a democratic deficit problem, uh, which it's had, although it's not because of institutions, uh, world governance has a democratic uh, cliff. My answer today is that the solution is not in, and again, that's not what I said 10 years ago. I wrote a book 10 years ago about how to democratize world governance. Uh, I think the mistake is to try and emulate national or local democratic systems at global level. That won't work. Uh, for one simple reason, which is that democracy works where people have a sense of uh, belonging, where there is a community, and where the legitimacy of power has to do with a sense of the people that this community needs power. And after all, again, that's good, because power has to be near to the people. So the basic question is legitimacy. There is ample room for an improvement of the international governance system, but not in the direction of dreaming that one day this will be a democratic power system. It's too far away. And unless uh, 9 billion people at the time on the planet feel that there are uh, 9 billion of, uh, citizens of the world, which I think will not happen anytime soon, then you have to look at the thing the other way around. You don't have to look at the thing the other how to globalize local problems, but how to localize global problems. How to treat global problems at the level where there is legitimacy. And this takes me back to this coalition model. Because this is something where civil society is quite good at localizing global problems, at rooting the awareness of a number of global issues in domestic, local public opinion. So I think that's, that's the way to go. I mean, it's not either or, but we cannot put all our eggs in the basket of improving global governance. And, and I would agree 100% that many things can be done, but that won't solve the essential of the problem. Let's go back to inequality, which we touched on at the start. Uh, perhaps the statistics uh, spark a revolution um, came out, which we published um, in the Autumn of the Economist, was that in the two, four years 2009 to 2012, the top 1% of the US population by wealth had real income gains of 31%, and the bottom 99% of Americans had real income gains of less than 1%. So the Occupy Wall Street people were essentially right in uh, dividing the society in that way. Um, Thomas Piketty is taking Amazon by storm. They sold out on Amazon.com of his 800-page uh, book on capital in the 21st century, which I do recommend, having read it all. Um, but you, his answer is a global capital tax, and given that the global capital tax is, has about 0% chance of being implemented, um, is, there, is it inevitable that we're going back to the 19th century um, model of Downton Abbey model of society? Um, <laughs> And if it isn't, how, how would you tackle it? Um, it, it if, if there's a, have you an alternative to global capital tax? Well, I think all of us would love to be down to Abbey as long as we're the lords yes. and the ladies, not the servants. So, although they, they seem to do all right. Um, so I think the, the most extraordinary uh, 
narrow, uh, narrative shift here that uh, Thomas Pickett has actually introduced is that uh, these questions now are demanding an answer. The answer of 80% tax on the rich or a global tax, people are going, how's that possibly the case? But even though it's not implementable, the fact that it's urgent, that this is an analysis that now says it is a contest. Politics, since it's about power and who wins and who misses out, is always a contest. And uh, I think the penny's dropping, thanks to Thomas's work, that actually it's a contest because there are people who are benefiting from the way the system is. He says that patrimony capital will continue to uh, not just ride on but destroy democracy, which is why it's suddenly a very alive contest. We're going, is that where we're headed uh, now? The other possibility is instead of um, uh, capital continuing to benefit if we get growth where, uh, of uh, the economy where wages and labour benefits, at least in proportion, there is an evening, an equivalent, simply than robbing from those with uh, wealth uh, or saying we're going to tax them. Uh, I think Paul Collier in a session earlier put it well. Uh, when we dismiss Piketty's view that um, you'll kill the goose that lays the golden egg if you just tax the wealthy. And uh, we all know that that's essentially the argument in this contest. It's, it's unimplementable because look at the counterproductive unintended consequences. An alternative view, which I think has a chance of winning, and Piketty certainly uh, contributed to this, is um, if everyone is paying tax, if it's not simply optional for some, and our friend from Oxfam saying that multinationals are paying 5%, most businesses are paying 30%. The profound unfairness about the system is at the moment, I think, is a winnable aspect of this debate, uh, rather than 80% uh, uh, tax on the rich. John, um, some would um, attribute inequality, rising inequality to the decline in power of trade unions since the 1970s. Would you take that? Uh, I mean, that's been a policy suggestion from organisations like the OECD since the 1970s, you know, let's decentralise bargaining, let's kind mm -hmm. of deal weak and labour market institutions. So I think changing that mindset is a key part of it. I mean, I, I think what's, I mean, the last time I listened to, to Thomas Piketty, he was sitting here actually, so I'm kind of writing this seat, so I'm looking forward to trying to find a book out on Amazon <laughs> soon. But, um, but uh, I mean, seriously, I don't think the argument is yet one that inequality, uh, that the problem of the 1% is a problem still. I think, you know, a lot of economists say, well, inequality is a problem, but this is really just a question of trying to bring up the bottom, so we all have a better growth, that's fine. I don't take that view. I think if you look at the connection of what we were talking earlier, the, the, you know, if you look at the 1% of the United States, the shares, you know, your, your, your paper has pointed out, jump from, you know, 8% in the US to over 20% now. As I said, I gave those figures, if you look over 30 years, but the 99% is losing nearly half of the actual increase in income. But that's actually building into the system a major distortion, which is essentially the sort of the goods, the, um, the sort of market system is being really loaded in, in, a, in a very distorted way, which actually now, according to IMF work, actually undermines growth in the longer term. I think in the short term, the problem is that the bulk of political funding, um, certainly in the United States, you know, which has to some extent been the model, that model of capitalism, uh, actually comes from that 1%. Uh, it's a rather small in the number of people uh, for both parties. So when it comes to some clear choices, and some clear hard things to push back policy, uh, the actual political system has been ringed, which then I think feels that trust itself is wrong. And you look at the preferences of 1% in terms of what they think about minimum wage increases, about whether you should give up to jobs over, over other issues like reducing deficits. I mean, 99% is over there, and the 1% of there. So I think there's a political issue, which is crucial. The question then is, how do you construct an agenda which begins to shift that? Now, I think tax is part of it. Um, again, I, I would say, just as Pascal is saying, we've got to go for tomorrow for a global wealth tax, or we've got to go for global governance. I don't think the issue is, how do you start to get progressivity back into the tax system? And I. I I buy into the levels of marginal taxation that Ronald Reagan had in the States, or, Pat, or Giscard d'Estaing had in France 30 years ago. If we can get back to those levels, that already starts to pull in the system. 
I think at the top, you need major corporate governance reforms as well as tax reforms, and I think you have to reel in the power of an elite, which is not just as much a capital owner, but which is actually controlling capital, in supposedly in the interests of wide range of companies. And in the middle and the bottom, I think what we have to do is to start expanding collective bargaining, expanding uh, negotiation, getting well set minimum wages. Now, all of those things are things which the OECD, the IMF, for too long have been saying we've got to get rid of that. Part of the great moderation is having weaker labor market institutions. I think now the balance has tipped so much, you have to get a stronger labor market institution and more people into representative organizations. There's a lot of other stuff as well on taxation and, uh, and also on education and so on. But I think those, that labor market institution question is the key. Uh, yeah, just to come back to you on the education point, um, another hot book, Rini Olsen and McAfee's Race Against the Machine, points out that you'll either be um, a complement to a computer or a robot in the future, or you'll be competing with them. And if you compete, you'll be on minimum wage or low wages. And one example, for the most common um, job for a male in America is driving something, taxi, truck, van. But driverless cars, driverless vans are probably perhaps 10, 15 years away. So. You, you could be in a situation where a whole another bunch of people are thrown out of their work in, by, by technology. How do we raise the education level of um, workers so that they get the next level of jobs, computer programmers or whatever it happens to be? Well, I think education is important, but I don't buy into a lumber labor fallacy that, you know, that, that there's certain jobs are changing, that everybody's going to be unemployed. It's the policy response which deals with that. But I think also, um, the problem is the 1% is really in the system. I mean, two thirds of private educational expenditure in the, in the US, I think, comes from the top 5%, not the top 1%. So you're getting an inbuilt bias in the whole system in the future. And the real question is how do you broaden out not just education, but other issues? Uh, and, and I think that's a question of power, it's a question of trying to get checks and balances built into the system again. Do you? Well, mm. People are not stupid, you know. We heard today as well saying that they are getting more and more intelligent every day. So they, they do not expect that all of them will be rich one day. They do not expect that they, they will be all equal say, to the upper one percent. But what they do expect is that they are to be treated equally, at least in principle, economically, socially, legally. So uh, and let's say what we do in our area, we are measuring sometimes their satisfaction with the legal equality or inequality. And uh, I can tell you that, let's say, if people in any country in the world feel that they, there's a more than average level of legal inequality in, in the country, they, they feel very dissatisfied, and the, the level, let's say, their mistrust is quite high. So but I'm not saying that uh, in all cases we will see the final result the same for the people. But what we can say and what we have to do is we have to establish the same proceedings and the same, let's say, uh, conditions for each of us. Of course, if you are more capable than I am, I don't have anything against you if you are, at the end of the day, you are much richer than I am. And this is being understood by the majority of people. Uh, of course, how to get there? You mentioned the, the, the taxation issue. Uh, the problem with some, in some areas, including the taxation one, is that we people are usually not satisfied. We only think that the taxation rate, which is great for us, it's extremely difficult, extremely problematic, especially if, if you compare it with the tax rate, which is applied for the rich guys. Uh, uh, but if we find proper solutions and if we ensure all our citizens that they, can be, they will be treated again in principle, in an equal way, then they will survive. And they will take part in whatever decision they have to make. Pascal? Well, uh, let, let me first welcome the fact that uh, by raising this uh, one percent issue for once, the economist uh, in the center left, that's good news for me because it's a good paper. So if, if, if we can substantiate what we think with proper good weekly, that's great. Second, I think what, what Piketty uh, reminds us uh, is that uh, market capitalism is uh, intrinsically inequalitarian. Not to make peace and news, but 
he puts the right numbers under these digits. And the his numbers are fresh, they are good, they are good quality numbers. He's a very solid economist. Uh, on the one side, on the other side, I believe uh, web tax is a good uh, is good politics, uh, but I don't think web tax will fix inequalities in uh, market capitalism uh, because it's just the numbers don't fit. Whatever we start to put, we'll never get to one fifth or one tenth of what you need in terms of social investment to address inequalities in uh, education, in uh, lodging, in culture. So it's not the solution to the problem he raises. I think, again, it makes sense for the reasons uh, which, which you just gave, which is that you know, people of the field treat a bit, uh, a bit better in terms of equality, and the, the tolerance to inequality is much higher in some civilization than others. Europeans, for instance, are very intolerant to inequalities as compared to Americans or Asians. And that's true, uh, you know, when you have, uh, when you have a small Gini coefficients, uh, is Sweden as well as uh, Switzerland. Uh, and Switzerland is not, you know, sort of dream social democrat system. It's a, it's a center-right European model. So I think the real issue is, given that market capitalism has this intrinsic machinery which you have to deal with that creates inequalities, how do you fix that? And I personally believe, and I've been looking at the examples of my country for quite a bit of time, that uh, public redistribution systems are not the essential solution. France spends huge amounts of money in trying to fix the consequences of inequalities, which its educational, its lodging system, keep constructing, keep increasing. And, and I, I know I'm a bit heterodox on this, but no, this notion that because we want to fight inequalities, 80% of the age class of young must have the baccalaureate, leads to people having uh, 25% rate of unemployment, whereas in a country which is next war, which is Switzerland, 20% of the natural age, age class has a baccalaureate and they have a 5% youth unemployment rate. So again, sometimes let's look at numbers and results on the ground. Well, let's look at some of the um, comments that have been coming in. And um, there's one that I wanted to ask you, which was um, how give an example, sorry, give an example of a measure that could be taken at the global level and could have a concrete impact on systems' daily lives. Maybe Tim, can you think of one of those? Um, I certainly think at a global level, the, uh, and I work for World Vision, so I come from a development uh, perspective here, uh, the importance of uh, saying you can't run a decent society without 40% of a tax base of GDP to pay for education and health and food security and clean water. Where most of the countries where World Vision works, it's uh, 12, 13% only uh, tax collection. Uh, and we wonder why there is uh, the extraordinary poverty. Though there is rich natural resources um, in so much of Africa, and we're seeing 6, 7% growth. So. Um, for me, one uh, global response is actually uh, uh, aid and OECD countries taking seriously capacity building in tax systems. Um, I know the OECD are, I think, working on a, uh, what are they called, a borderless tax inspectors, uh, um, like Medicine Sans Frontier. I think um, that engagement uh, is incredibly important uh, in terms of then not just relying on charity, World Vision relies on that, or aid, or patchwork uh, responses. So investing seriously in capacity uh, in developing countries, in their revenue collection, their skills, I think is a really important response. Pascal, perhaps you could be second on this, as it's your area. 
Well, I can easily think of uh, three uh, such measures that would uh, impact and change uh, people's lives. Uh, set the carbon price at uh, 50 euros a ton. That's a global decision that would change a lot of people's lives. Uh, uh, and declare uh, higher fuel prices for big one. Higher fuel prices for everybody. 50, 50, 50 euros a ton of carbon. And then you insert this and all the pricing of energy everywhere. It's a simple one. Uh, uh, no fishing on high sea uh, as long as uh, stocks keep uh, digging. Simple one. Decision by sovereigns can do that. Uh, and then have uh, an international standard for the uh, fat content of food so that obesity doesn't become uh, 30 years from now. Uh, the equivalent of what uh, HIV AIDS uh, was 20 years ago. So, uh, but I suppose those are all quite nanny statish things. That you can see, I mean, one of the problems that if you go back to Matt Carroll Olsen is that you get you know, things that might be good for everybody, but interest, special interest groups are very interested in opposing. So, take your fishering, fisheries idea. There will be fishermen all around France. Uh, for example, I'm sure the road would be blocked in five minutes, but even, the, even, they would, would oppose these moves, and the people who would benefit would be a bit indifferent. People would, truck drivers have blocked the roads in Britain about higher fuel prices. Again, they would feel passionately about it. Uh, the, which, is, which, is why, which is why the notion that if there's agreement at the international level, yeah. I mean, if everybody agrees on that, then it will work. The problem is, and we know, and you know, the three examples, at least two of them, are in some sort of uh, negotiating pot. The reason why it doesn't work is that everybody tries to get the best out of it. Yeah. Well, maybe just mention a, a, an initiative which, if it works, might make a real change. I mean, a year ago, when this forum was taking place, it was. Um, I think about a month after the Rhino Plaza disaster in Bangladesh, where you had a you know, factory collapse of 1,200 people killed straight off, and um, this was all producing goods for, you know, apparel industry and uh, sold sold around under the main brands. And uh, a lot of my colleagues have been working for the last year to try to put together a coalition, which I think is its form a little bit like what Pascal's recommending in his report. Uh, that actually reaches an agreement to try to get rid of dangerous factories, um, to give workers some rights to refuse to work, to make sure they're represented by unions, to get factory inspectors into those plants, uh, where companies, where the brands commit not to leave Bangladesh for a period of several years, but to try and actually make it work, so they're not just going to move out to another, another producer because it's cheaper. Uh, and that's legally enforceable under civil law in the home countries where the brands are located. And there's now, I think, over 120 or 130 brands which have signed up to that. And people like Phil Jennings who was talking this morning on the panel was sort of trying to make this work. So I think in terms of looking at supply chains, social conditions now supply chains, given the fact most of our goods are in many consumer areas are sourced, that's crucial. But I think the question, and it comes back to the OECD really, is why does that have to happen after the event? I mean, I, I'm talking to colleagues and saying, you know, we haven't got enough inspectors, we can't do this, the situation on the ground is still appalling. I mean, why not actually put that in as a, uh, an ex ante condition for good investment down the line uh, for investment locations? Not just a question of low taxes or uh, low costs in a particular area, but to try to actually deal with the reputational risk of those brands. So I think if you, and the OECD guidelines are multinationals, the short answer would be, you know, if that was enforced globally uh, by the countries which are signed to it, which has still got a large proportion of over foreign investors, it would make a real difference. So how do you get some collective action around those sorts of questions which really improve the living conditions of, of workers on the ground in a, in, a, in a global economy? I just want to come back to this. Um, we're also talking about trade-offs here. So um, Pascal's answer, I want, you know, there's probably some trade-off between democracy and, and problem solving there. I don't know how many people would vote for limits on fattiness in food or higher fuel prices. So do we have to say, well, it's good for you, so we're going to impose it on you anyway. That's one. But also the right to withdraw labour. Uh, we were talking before the session that tube strike in London has just been called off for today. But 
there you, if, if Sainsbury's, if one supermarket goes on strike, I can go to another supermarket. If a transport system goes on strike, that's real inconvenience for the vast majority of people who stop doing their work, or their work is made a lot more difficult as a result of it. So there's this kind of, back to Isaiah Berlin, and positive freedom and negative freedom. The work is exercising their freedom, we're imposing hardship not on men in top hats with cigars, but the ordinary people who are trying to get to work every day. But the union power is now largely in the hands of those people in the public sector, right? The, 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 because of competition in the private sector, it's people on don't tend to go and strike perhaps so much in the private sector because it's self-defeating. In the public sector, when you put a monopoly, you can impose costs on the innocent rest of the population. Just two points, that's a good economist point of view, which also called Piketty the new Marx, if I may say, last week as well. So um, that's, you're moving away from your centre-left position. <laughs> no, just two points, one of which I think, you know, uh, and certainly the large majority of my colleagues in the trade union movement would see a good industrial relations system gets to a situation where people don't have to go on strike. You reach agreement, you do a deal, there's trust between the social partners, then you implement it. I think when there are strikes, there's very, very often uh, a shared blame on certain circumstances in both sides of the both sides of the agenda, but uh, I won't go into the London tube strike to say exactly where that blame lies. But the I, I think the more the more general point is that the an economic analysis now of institutions like trade unions, collective bargaining, and so on. I mean, even the World Bank has come to the conclusion that at the end of the day, there's not really a trade-off between efficiency. Uh, and actually labour market institutions in terms of coverage. I mean, you can look at the Nordic model, you look at other models, which show you have a very efficient system. So the debate should really be about what are the types of system which allow workers to have the right to strike. I think at the end of the day, if a worker doesn't right, have the right not to go into a factory that's going to collapse and withdraw his labour there, then you're basically commi you know, committing him, as happened in Rhino Plaza, uh, to uh, effectively murder. But even in a more less extreme situation, um, that's an extreme, you know, sanction drawing the right, the right to strike. So the issue is, those institutions are not necessarily bad for efficiency. If you get it right, you can have that both. But what they do do is they reduce inequality, and that gets back to the argument. I mean, there's a very nice curve between levels of union membership and levels of uh, actually pre-tax inequality in different countries. So if you don't want to put all of the emphasis on the tax system, I think the real issue is how do you start raising wages again at the moment and start eating into those, those, uh, those rents at the top 1%. Let's go to another comment from the audience, which is, um, <clears throat> Drago, I'll ask you about this one. Is revolution a better reallocation mechanism than education and taxation reforms? Interest rate? Now, perhaps the answer is a difficult question to answer, but maybe the, the related topic is, if we don't address these issues of inequality, if we don't increase trust in societies, will we have revolutions? We've had many in history. Will democracies break down altogether? <clears throat> You're right, you know, when those are, you don't go far back in the history to find those revolutions. You see, we have so called Arab Spring. We have uh, some very, let's say, very hot events in, in the Balkans in the last year. Uh, so, I'm not saying revolutions are a good thing, uh, because they usually bring many, many bad things along, and it's difficult. If the revolution usually destroys everything what is there, and you have to, to start building things from the scratch. But the fact is, if you want to develop things as education, uh, if you want to work on taxation issues, if you want to work on the let's say, legal equality issues, then of course citizens are becoming more and more uh, dissatisfied. <coughs> and sometimes they react abruptly. And you have big, big problems if you, as you have some countries in, let's say, in, in the Arab world. And speaking nowadays with, with some citizens of some countries in, in the upper world, you could see, easily see that uh, not all of them are very happy what was the final result of the, those revolutions. And what is even more present there is they're saying, well, it's not over yet. You see, <coughs> we are not done yet. We, we will just wait to see what, what the new government will do. They say, I've been to Ukraine one month ago. And I'm even surprised to say, that guys are still sitting in, in the Maidan. No, no, no TV, of course, I don't know, it's understandable, there are some different problems in Ukraine. But uh, Ukraine, revolution, is not, it's not over yet. Guys are still sitting there waiting for the new Ukrainian government will do, not in the terms of fighting, say, pro-Russian uh, activists and people who would like to get away from, from Ukraine, 
but in the terms of fighting, let's say, corruption, fighting economic inequality, and so on and so on. And they are very clear on that, saying, we will not give them so much time as we gave to the previous ones. No, our patience is very short term, so we will do it again. And of course, this does not mean that uh, they didn't define a result, plus I have to say this. Despite the fact that there, there have been, let's call them revolutions, I, and despite the fact that at least a certain percentage, percentage of the reasons for those revolutions were, were was dissatisfaction of people, how they, the legal equality was presented before them, how people were treated, I must say that visiting some of those countries, I think that can still see that the, even the new governments, they did, not learn, they did not learn the lesson yet, because they don't have any serious intentions to fight corruption. Of course, they are all saying they will do it, but in practical terms, there's not too much difference between those ones and the new ones. But maybe I'll come back to you on the Yugoslavia there. There's a, there's a legitimacy issue there in Ukraine, obviously. One set of people do not rec recognize that another, that a certain government can be legitimate. So the Russian speaking population don't recognize that a pro Western population can be legitimate, and the, the Ukrainian, ethnic Ukrainian people don't recognize that a pro Russian government can be legitimate. In Yugoslavia, you had the problem that, you know, in the end, a, a, a country that had been sort of cobbled together in the Treaty of Versailles, um, it, it was only held together by Tito for a long period, and then the, the various people did not rep recognize that a Belgrade government could represent them. Isn't that, isn't that the issue? And is that, does that make life more difficult in a globalized world? You know, you, we got to a stage post 1945 where countries were quite ethnically monoplot. Now we're back to um, multicultural societies. Is Yugoslavia sort of war warning and Ukraine a warning that what, what can happen in a multicultural society if the different uh, minorities clash? I would, I would say so, yeah, possibly. But you see, that, that, that's exactly the, the direction in which I didn't want to go into it. You know. <laughs> I had to mention that uh, no, guys sitting in mind and they don't care about uh, this Ukraine Russian thing. But, what, what they do care is how the new government will function in the term of uh, public governance, functions with the state of law, the rule of state, and, and so on. So, uh, what you have asked me, you know, I really don't want to go along the stuff because we will end, you know. Well, thank you, yeah, I'm sorry. It's about my, my mind going wrong direction. <laughs> Let's take another question from the audience, which is, um, is federalism a cause for institutional incompetence and distrust, since there are multiple levels of government and therefore Jurisdiction. So that brings in this local, national, multinational issue, Tim. Uh, jet lag kicking in, sorry about that. Um, so uh, I think, you know, that, that last conversation was really around it, identity politics, whether it's religious or ethnic, and the passion of that identity politics <laughs> always trumps the bloodless rule of law and transparency and... Uh, uh, notions of institution building which is a bit arm's length and distant. Now, I think federalism has that same trouble. Uh, when it's local and it's a natural community and there is an energy zone around uh, who we are and what we want, um, to then have another layer of government, we've got this in Australia, three tiers of government, where there is uh, a loss of legitimacy because clearly it is duplication, it is overlapping, it is turf conscious fighting over uh, do we have the right to raise revenue for the responsibilities to deliver services which are overlapping actually is a bit of a nightmare and in Australian politics given only 22 pe people but a continent the size of uh, the USA without Alaska um, you're going to have to have a number of local state governments, but the overlapping of a national government robs a sense of focus, of energy, and it's a problem we haven't found a way of solving. I think when you move that to global areas, it does say, how do you harness that energy zone of natural community resonance, which does engender trust. It's not the amount of trust or, or lack of trust often that's the issue, it's what your trust is in. So um, certainly President Putin has uh, huge amounts of 
reservoirs of trust from people in, in Russia now for his stance on the eastern Ukraine. But is the object of the trust actually worthy? How is this going to end up? It's an energy zone that, um, as we know in world history, can play out with uh, disastrous and devastating consequences. So globally, I think it's finding ways to actually demarcate where those energy zones are, transfer powers to other more super uh, local uh, jurisdictions, national, global, and agree with the politicians will explain why that demarcation is necessary for all of our good. Really tricky, takes high skill and sophistication and usually politicians play the, the uh, push the button of ethnic or religion or local tribe rather than uh, handing over the powers. Pascal, I, I want to bring in a, a different question. And, uh, this is, can we return to the topic of institution and competence? What's driving so many countries, including the UK, Seagates for the European Union? But um, we can, John and I could probably have a go at that. But, but in France, I think we, I'd like you to comment about Marine Le Pen's rise to um, popularity. And the, you know, France, the most communitaire of the uh, EU countries, there is a very strong anti EU um, uh, movement behind Marine Le Pen. And I'd just be very interested in your views on why that is. Yeah, and you have your, uh, you keep, uh, you have our Le Pen. Uh, and if you could turn it off, by the way, I would, I would sign immediately. Uh, I'm afraid that's not on the cards. Uh, I think it stems from uh, uh, two main factors. Uh, one which is a short term one, which is the impact of a, a huge economic and social crisis. And we know by here that uh, in each of these periods where there is economic and social pain, uh, uh, extremists uh, uh, will vote because it's so easy to scapegoat whatever uh, the government, the Brussels, the China, Germany, uh, immigrants, uh, Arabs, uh, for evils and for pain, which which is there. So that's the sort of hopefully short term issue. Now there's something uh, more long term, which which has to do with the, with the previous question. Uh, which is uh, this issue, uh, how do you build legitimacy in a supranational political space, which is what building a European political union is about. And that's a question uh, which we already touched on that a moment ago when we uh, mentioned this issue of a democratic deficit. Uh, this, is, this is a very complex question because it's not just a question of institutions. After all, European institutions are 100% democratic in the way they, they all fit the recipe book of how do you build a democracy. The question is that it's not fed this way. It's not, you know what Barnaby called the frigid Europe. It just doesn't work. So you go to the institutional doctor, and the institutional doctor tells you, oh, it's fine. No, look at everything. Nothing wrong. Yeah, but doctor, it doesn't work. When you have to go to another doctor, which is more on the psychoanalytical side. And that's, <laughs> that's, I think, that's, I think, the problem. And this is what we haven't yet investigated. But it has to do with a, a proper uh, sort of a federalist behavior. And that's, that's back to the previous question. And it's what we call, what we call responsible federalism, i.e subsidiarity, which is rule number one is that the power has to be near to the people. It only can take a distance if proof necessary. So the burden of the proof is on the one that says another level of governance need to be built. And second, you need a proper behavior. And that's very difficult because local politicians will always have the temptation to scapegoat the upper level. Uh, you know, if you're in Arkansas or Minnesota, uh, the big game down there is blaming Washington. Uh, and as it is, by the way, in the European Union, like Marine Le Pen blaming Brussels. Uh, so it works, but we have to get accustomed to new political spaces this time. And it takes time, and I think the experience of the European Union is one which others uh, should look at extremely carefully in order to understand the uh, anthropolitics of that, not just 
the institutions, not just the economics, not the, the legal systems, but how really human societies have to cope with new levels of power in this globalized world. Uh, I, I want to throw open to old technology and people actually.